Please join me as I bow in prayer. Dear God of heaven, in this hour, please use me to speak your words and your words only. And may you be lifted up in this session. May your Holy Spirit be in our hearts and may your Holy Spirit speak through me too. In Jesus' name I pray, Amen. It is still in the month of January and New Year resolutions is still ringing in most of our hearts, especially in my hearts. I'm always excited to set my New Year resolutions. Now I wonder what kind of New Year resolutions would the people in 1844 will be setting? Now 1844, there was a great event. It is known as the Great Day of Disappointment. So in that year, the people were hoping and they believed. They believed that Jesus Christ would come back in that year. So if Jesus Christ were to come back this year, what kind of new resolutions will I be setting? I can only imagine what were they thinking in their mind. Would they say that this year I'll gain more money, I'll build my wealth? Would they say that this year is a time where I put away all of my hatred from my enemies? What kind of new resolutions would they be setting? Then it brings my mind back to the children of Israel when they were at the borders of the Promised Land. What kind of new resolution would they be setting? They have been travelling through the desert for 40 years. They have been stuck before that in Egypt for 400 years. And now finally, they are finally standing in front of the Promised Land. What kind of New Year resolutions would they have? Maybe it's God, I will no longer sin against you. I don't want to go back to slavery. God, I will never be stubborn again. Because in my stubbornness, I have suffered in the desert for 40 years. What kind of New Year resolutions would they be setting? Now in the midst of all the excitements of while I'm setting the New Year resolutions, it always comes to my mind that how long can my New Year resolution last? Maybe until the end of the year? Maybe until the end of February? Maybe until the end of January? How long will my New Year resolution last? The question is, do I give up easily? Will we give up easily in our New Year resolution? This brings me to my first point. Satan does not give up easily. Satan does not give up easily. Please turn with me in your Bibles to Numbers chapter 20 and verse 1. I'll be reading from verse 1 to verse 5. Numbers 20 verse 1 to 5. Then came the children of Israel, even the whole congregation, into the desert of Zin in the first month. And the people abode in Kadesh, and Miriam died there, and was buried there. The verse starts off in two sections. The first section says that this is the first month of the year. Now this brings us to the timeline that this is the 40th year, that this is the final point. The children of Israel were at the borders of the Promised Land. The second half of this verse says that Miriam died there and was buried there. What is significant to me in this verse is that 40 years ago, when they were first exiting Egypt, they faced a problem. The problem is that there is too much water in front of them. The Red Sea is just right before them and there was too much water. They faced a water problem. Now, they cannot turn behind because the Egyptian army is chasing them and is after them to take their lives. So cannot move backwards, cannot move forwards. They now seek help from God. 40 years ago, they had a water problem. But God opened a way and Miriam was a praise and worship leader at the time. But 40 years has passed and Miriam has died. And this brings us to verse 2. And there was no water for the congregation. And they gathered themselves together against Moses and against Aaron. Forty years ago, it was a water problem. The problem was too much water. Forty years later, is that there is no water. It seems like Satan is always using the same tactic. It's the water problem. Whether it's forty years ago, too much water, or forty years later, there's no water. It's always water. Satan does not give up easily. He often uses the same problem to attack us. The same pain to attack us. Sometimes he says that the old me is gone and the new me is come. I'm going to reach forward to get the new me. New year resolutions is a new year and it's a new me. But Satan comes in and says, 
Are you sure that you can leave your pain behind? Are you sure you can leave your struggles behind? Are you sure you can be a new me this year? And Satan comes in and reminds us of the problem that he instilled to us years ago. It is still a water problem. Verse 3-5 to And the people showed with Moses and spake, saying, Would God that we had died when our brethren died before the Lord? And why have ye brought up the congregation of the Lord into this wilderness, that we and our cattle should die there? And wherefore have ye made us to come out of Egypt to bring us in unto this evil place? It is no place of seed, or figs, or vines, or pomegranates, neither is there any water to drink. The children of Israel had seemed to have forgotten that they are facing the same problem. Is it true that we cannot move forward because Satan has always used the same tactic and we have always fallen short of the same tactic that he used? Is it true that we cannot reach forward with the pain in our heart at times in the past? That sometimes maybe we make a mistake in the past and because the mistake, we feel so guilty about it that sometimes it prevents us in moving forward. Satan does not give up easily, so he always comes in and taunts us and reminds us from all of our pains. And because he does not give up easily, he will do whatever it takes to make us fail. With all of this, is there hope of moving forward? In the Bible it says, in Philippians chapter 4 verse 8, in Philippians chapter 4 verse 8, it gives us the solution. What happens when Satan reminds us of all the pains and all the struggles we have in the past? How can we move forward? Philippians chapter 4 and verse 8. Finally, brethren, whatsoever things are true, whatsoever things are honest, whatsoever things are just, whatsoever things are pure, whatsoever things are lovely, whatsoever things are of good report, if there be any virtue, and if there be any praise, think on these things. There is hope. A mistake done in the past, if Satan reminds us, there is still hope. Because each and every time Satan comes in whispering, hey, you cannot move forward. We can cut off that thought, that negative thought and say, no, I'm not the same again. God has forgiven my life and hence, I will move forward. Cut off all negative thoughts. The verse says here is to think of good thoughts. Think on positive thoughts. Any thoughts that is worthy to be praised. Being embarrassed, is that something worthy to be praised? It is not. Being guilty, is that something worthy to be praised? It is not. Suffering and pain, is that something to be worthy of praise? It is not. When Satan comes in and reminds us that we cannot move forward, may we learn to cut off the thoughts of all the negative thoughts and move forward with the positive thoughts. I'm moving on to my second point. My second point for today is that identify the enemy. Identify the enemy. I would like to read verse 5 again. And wherefore, ye have, wherefore have ye made us to come out of Egypt, to bring us unto this evil place? It is no place of seed, or figs, or vines, or pomegranates, neither is there any water to drink. The verse says, Wherefore have ye made us. The children of Israel is speaking to Moses and Aaron and they say, Moses and Aaron, why have you brought us out from Egypt? The question is, did Moses and Aaron, were they the one to bring them out from Egypt? Were they the one who protect them in the desert for 40 years? No. It was not Moses and Aaron. The Israelites at that point have seemed to have forgotten that it was God who has brought them out from Egypt. Then how about Moses and Aaron? What was in their mind? Let's go on to verse 10. And Moses and Aaron gathered the congregation together before the rock. And he said unto them, Hear now, ye rebels, must we fetch you water out of this rock? It seems as if that even Moses and Aaron have forgotten that it was God who led them out. Because Moses says, Must we fetch you water? Were Moses and Aaron the one who provide them water to drink? 
it seems as if their leader also have forgotten that who is the true leader behind the scene. And the sad part is when we forget who our leader is, we also forget who our enemy is. The Israelites, each and every time they need help, the, the man that they could think of is Moses. Moses will solve all of my problems. I can trust in him. He is there for me. He is behind my back. But now, because they have forgotten that it was God who have led them, they have also identified the wrong enemy. They have identified, identified Moses and Aaron as their own enemy. And how about Moses and Aaron? He says, Hear now, ye rebels. The words are really sad because Moses have been given for his life to take care of these people for 40 years. Each and every day, he wake up in the morning and all in his mind is to, I'm going to bring these people to the promised land. He prayed for them. He loved them. He cared for them. He had patience for them. But when he failed to remember who was the one that had led him, he identified the wrong enemy. To the people that he loved and cared for, he called them rebels. Many of the times, I'm just the same, like the Israelites and like Moses. I have failed to identify my enemy and I look at my friends around me, my family members around me, and the people around me as my enemy. I get provoked, get offended, get frustrated with people whom I love, with people who love me. It is because I failed to identify the real enemy. If this is a perfect world, will the people complain? If this is a perfect world, will my enemy fight against me? No. If this is a perfect world, if there is no Satan inside here, all of our thoughts will be good thoughts and we will be in unity as a family. But many of the times I have failed to identify the enemy. When someone compares with me with another person, Oh, Kevin, you're so lousy. Look at them. They can move so fast. Why are you so slow? I get offended. Kevin, you should work hard, work better. Look around you. When are you going to grow up? Then I get offended. Why should I get offended at, at the people that I love? They are not my enemy. It was Satan the one who has instilled the thoughts in their minds. It is Satan the one that is disturbing. But at that moment, I failed to identify the enemy. And I let anger, frustration to be in my heart. When I fail to identify the enemy, I'm relying on my strength. Now, if I'm fighting against another human being as my enemy, all I need to find is the strongest human being. Just find another person that is bigger size than me to stand on my side and I can win the battle. But my enemy is not flesh and blood. My enemy is a supernatural being. Please turn with me to Ephesians. Ephesians chapter 6. Ephesians 6 verse 11 to 13. Ephesians 6 verse 11 to 13. Put on the whole armour of God, that ye may be able to stand against the wiles of the devil. For we wrestle not against flesh and blood, but against principalities, against powers, against the rulers of the darkness of this world, against spiritual wickedness in high places. Wherefore, take unto you the whole armour of God, that ye may be able to stand in the evil day, and having done all, to stand. The Bible says, We wrestle not against flesh and blood. Our enemy is not another human being. Our enemy is not our friends or family. Our enemy is the devil himself. And if we fail to identify the enemy, we will fail to use the correct strategy. But if we know that we are fighting against the devil, the only solution is to run to God and put on the armour that he has given us. As I move on to my last point, please allow me to pray one more time. Dear God, the last point is the point of grace. And I need your full grace to be upon me and upon everyone here. And speak through me right now. In Jesus' name I pray, Amen. My last point is that when we fail, reach out for grace. What happens when we fail to identify the enemy? 
What happens when we get angry at our fellow friends and family? When we make a mistake, there are consequences. And it's very painful to suffer the consequences. Sometimes the consequences last for a month, a year, sometimes even last for a lifetime. Are we left alone to suffer all of these consequences? When we make a mistake, are we left alone to suffer the pain? Point number three, when we fail, reach out for grace. There is grace to be found. So when we fail, reach out for grace. Numbers 20 and verse 11. What happened when Moses failed? What happened when the children of Israel failed? Numbers 20 and verse 11. And Moses lifted up his hand, and with his rod he smote the rock twice. And the water came out abundantly. And the congregation drank, and their beasts also. The command to Moses was, Moses, the people needs water. So all you have to do is you speak to the rock, and water will come flowing out. But Moses, in his anger, did not speak to the rock. Moses took the rod in his hand and hit the rock twice. But in his mistake, the Bible records faithfully that the water came out abundantly. That not only did the people have enough to drink, even their animals have water to spare. When we fail, we are not left alone. When we fail, reach out for grace because grace can be found. When we fail, reach out for grace. When we make a mistake while well, we are suffering in the midst of the consequences, reach out for grace because we are not alone. Because in Romans chapter 5, verse 20, Romans chapter 5, verse 20, the Bible says, Moreover, the law entered that the offense might abound, but where sin abounded, grace did much more abound. Where there is sin, there is also grace. Where sin abounds, Grace did abound much more. When we make a mistake and we are suffering the consequences, we're not left alone to despair because where sin abounds, grace did abound much more. When the taunting of Satan comes in and he whispers to your ear, oh, you have done something wrong and you're left alone. God has said you should not do this and you should not do that, but you have disobeyed him. Now you're left alone. Don't listen to the devil. Reach out for grace because we are not left alone. Because where sin abounds, grace did abound much more. The consequences of sin can be seen all around us. The pandemic is one of the biggest proof. The masks that we are all wearing is one of the biggest proof. Death is also one of it. Imagine a family that is of five downsize to four. Imagine a family of four become, becomes three. A parting of a family member from our life can be very painful. But although the power of sin can be seen around us, the power of grace can be seen as well. For where grace, where, where sin abounds, grace did much more abounds. Reach out for grace. The results of grace can be seen in the children of Israel. They ask for water, they fail, they have water to drink. But was there grace for Moses? Was it fair for Moses? Where is the grace for Moses? Moses has been faithful to bring them out from Egypt, taking them through the desert for 40 years. And he just made one mistake, just one mistake. And the command from God to him is that, Moses, you are not to enter the promised land. Where is the grace for Moses? The command from God came, Moses, you climb up to Mount Nebo, and there you will die alone. Usually climbing up the mountain is a joyful thing for Moses, because it is usually a time to spend with God. He is either climbing up the mountain to receive the Ten Commandments, or climbing up the mountain to speak to God, face to face 
I mean, of course, God is standing behind his back, but he's speaking to God on the top of the mountain. And that is usually a joyful time for Moses. But this time, it's different. This time, the command for Moses is that, Moses, you climb up to Mount Nebo, and there, you will die alone. What kind of emotions will Moses have? As he is taking his last hike, he knew that at the top of the mountain, he's going to die. Where is my grace? Moses may ask. At the top of the mountain, there was a vision given to him. Now Moses was looking all around the horizon and he could see that that was where they were traveling from Egypt to all the way to the promised land. You can see the battles that they fought. You can see where they don't have water and where they had water. It's been 40 years, so it should be many times they don't have water. So you can see all of the events and you can also see the place where he had filled. While seeing all of that, God gave him a vision. Moses saw the children of Israel enter the promised land. Everything is a happy thing. They renew their commitments to God. They settle down. After a long time of traveling, finally they have a home. Then he saw them backslided, living God. Going to the captives of the Babylon. Then after that, coming back to Jerusalem once again. The vision continued. Moses saw baby Jesus. Moses saw Jesus come to this world. He saw how the wise men traveled from a far place to give Jesus gifts. He saw how shepherds come in and pay their worship to the Savior. The vision continues. He saw Jesus grow up and he saw Jesus in his public ministry. He saw Jesus suffering in the Garden of Gethsemane when he was praying for us. He saw Jesus down the roads of Calvary. He saw how everyone rejected Christ. He saw the pain that he has to go through. Then Moses heard the voice from the Savior's lips, Father, Father, why have you forsaken me? Moses heard those words. The vision then continued. Moses then see Jesus rising up from the grave and ascending up to heaven. And this was a glorious sin. He can see that Jesus is now walking to the gates of heaven and behind Jesus is hosts of angels escorting Jesus into the heavenly gates. They are inviting their saviour or their king after a long time in planet earth ministry. Now they are walking to the gates of heaven. And as they are approaching, the gates of heaven is being opened. So Jesus is walking in, the gates are open, and there are people welcoming Jesus to heaven. It was there that it was revealed to Moses that Moses came out from the gates of heaven and invite Jesus into heaven as well. The thing that I've just mentioned can be found in Patriarchs and Prophet, page 475. Was there grace for Moses? Yes. Surely there's grace for Moses. We all know that Moses is in heaven. But Moses knew that Moses was in heaven before he died. Sister White wrote that after the vision, Moses, the tired warrior, laid down and rest. He had fought his battle. He had seen his reward. And he found his rest. Was there grace for Moses? It was at the top at the Mount of Pisgah's lofty height, that Moses willed his home and took his flight, knowing that in his immortal flesh he will rise and to seize his everlasting prize. Moses found his grace. Where sin abound, grace did much more abound. In closing, I would like to share a story. A story of a man named Ernest Shackleton. Now, Ernest Shackleton is an explorer. So in those days, they would explore lands, undiscovered lands, to enlarge their territory. In 1914, Ernest Shackleton and 27 of his crew members went out for an expedition. Their goal is to travel to the Antarctic, to the South Pole. That's the place that they want to discover. That's the place where they want to expand. Moving six weeks into their expedition, they were stuck 
in a mass of ice. Their ship was stuck. Their ship cannot move forward, cannot move backward, cannot move to the left, cannot move to the right because all around the ship were packs of ice. Their ship was stuck. So in the next 10 months, they live in the boat. Next 10 months, they live in the ship. All the food, all the water are being used. Day by day, they see their food supplies dropping. And in their minds, they know that if we continue to live on, we'll surely all die in this boat. So Ernest Shackleton and his crew members decided, we are to abandon this ship, take what we can in our lifeboat, and travel to a place where we can seek for refuge. Over there, a few members will then go and call for help and come to rescue all of us. So that was what they did. They abandoned their ship and traveled in three lifeboats. Now the lifeboat is 20 foot long, but it's an open boat. So imagine with me, there's no roof, there's no covering. If there is thunderstorm, they will face the thunderstorm. If there is cold air, they will feel the cold air. And this is in the South Pole. It's very cold. Traveling to the place, Ernest Shackleton and four of his crew members said, we will go to a place called South Georgia Island. This is 800 miles away. And you all stay here and wait for me. Now, Ernest Shackleton, before he left, he looked at his crew members and he said, I will come back. And when I come back, be ready and waiting. There is no time for reunion. There is no time of, oh, welcome back. There is no time for gathering, no, no time to throw a party because when I come back, it's time to leave. When I come back, be ready and waiting. So Ernest Shackleton left. Was, was it a pleasant journey for him? Historians have said that while he was traveling through the storm, the waves were 90 feet high and the winds were 150 miles per hour. Historians have also said that in that same storm that Ernest Shackleton and his crew members were traveling in the open boat, there was a 500 ton steamer, a very nice ship that sank into the deep of the ocean. But Ernest Shackleton and his crew members made it alive. So we put Ernest Shackleton and his crew members aside. They reached to Georgia Island and they are on their way back to rescue. How about the people that is left in that island? That island where they are taking refuge is not a safe place. It is called Elephant Island. In that place, you don't have a shelter. If there is storm, you'll face a storm. If there is lightnings, you will see the lightnings. You will suffer whatever you need to suffer in that island. Elephant Island is not a place of habitation. Where is their place of refuge? Their lifeboat where they brought along, they overturn it and make a roof and they live under the boat. For weeks, they have waited for the captain. They have been convinced that they are going to die because their food resources is depleting. They are convinced that their captain could have died in the storm because it's not an easy journey. They suffered the cold, the hunger, the thirstiness. They suffered everything they could have suffered. But when their captain returned, each and every one of them were ready and waiting. The transition from the island to the boat is taken in minutes. If they have not packed their bags, it would have taken hours. But because they were all ready and waiting, no waiting time is needed. They got on board and they left. Ernest Shackleton and his 27 crew members all survived that expedition. Today, in the month of January, year 2022, as we set our New Year resolutions, it is as if, like, to me, we are setting New Year resolutions on Elephant Island. The place is not nice. We are suffering. We can see all the pains for ourselves, our friends, our loved ones. We can see the pandemic, that everyone is still wearing a mask. But while seeing all of that, may we remember that our captain, has gone ahead of us. He has went to heaven. And before leaving earth, he said the same thing. He said, I will come back. And when I do come back, be ready and waiting. One day our Savior will be coming back. And when He come back, may He find us ready and waiting. My three points for today. Number one. Number one is that Satan does not give up easily. 
He looks at us all the time and He tries to remind our past pain and struggles. But there is hope because there is Jesus Christ. In times like this, when He reminds us of our past pain and suffering, remember positive things. Cut off negative thoughts and remember positive thoughts. Point number two, identify the enemy. Our enemy is not flesh and blood, is not our friends, family, is not another human being. Our enemy is the devil. Identify the enemy. But what if we fail? Let us not forget, if we do fail, we are not left alone to suffer the consequences. Because where sin abound, grace did much more abound. Please join me as I close in prayer. Dear God, if there is one point that we can remember today, may we remember that you are our Saviour. That in the midst of the suffering, you are the person who can save us out from our trouble. In our sin, we remember your grace. In our sufferings, we remember you as well. For where sin abounds, grace did much more abound. May your Spirit be in our life and touch us. And may we be ready and waiting as you return. In Jesus' name I pray, Amen.